Good day EVTV viewers, my name is Danu De Silva and I'm here with our ESP32 V2 controller. It's the ESP32 BMS controller for the Tesla Model S battery module. Now that's a long name so I'm going to keep referring it to as the version 2 or V2 for short. So if you remember I made a video previously uh, about explaining all what this controller can do. And today I'm going to be doing a deep dive into the charge enable and heat enable ports. So previously I said we can control chargers or heating pads and etc. So today I'm going to kind of explain what our software can do with these two ports and kind of answer some technical questions that I've been getting over email. The link for the previous video will be in the description for the Tesla Model S uh, BMS controller uh, instructions. So today I'm going to be explaining how this is going to be booting up and answering some technical questions about it. So I'm going to put this piece of plastic, so I'm going to angle this that you can see the lights. So I had, went ahead and pressed the blue switch, which is our 12 volts, uh, converts 24 volts or 48 volts down to 12 volt, and the DC to DC converter powers the bus bar, which supplies powers to the whole controller. Now what it's doing is connecting to the Wi-Fi first, and then it'll communicate with the modules. And if it is within parameters, you see first we close the negative contactor, now what's happening now is pre-charging. It's bringing up the voltage of the outside, the, ex the external side of the ESP32 controller up to the voltage of the battery. So I'm going to kind of explain what pre-charging is. So if you have a DC switch on your inverter side of this controller, and if you were to have that off and you did this pre-charging and then you turn that switch on, you defeated the purpose of the pre-charging. And what happens now is a big inductive load on the output side, inductive or capacitive load, um, will cause a current surge that goes from 48 volts, or on the inverter side from 0 volts, to 48 volts. So the purpose of a pre-charging is we bring that voltage up in a controlled way. So a controlled amount of current flows through a resistor, bringing the voltage up from 0 to about 30, 40, 45 volts, and then eight seconds later, we close both contactors and we have a full non resistive connection from the battery to the inverter. So the reason I'm trying to explain this is we've had multiple uh, customers come up with this problem where this is a gigawatt contactor. We have two of these in here where these have get, gotten welded. And you can see Physically, it doesn't really look any burnt marks or damages. We just had this red sticker identifying that it's bad. But what I'm going to show you is if I do a continuity test, uh, I don't know if you can see this clear enough, but I'm going to try across this resistor, oh, this contactor, I am getting 0 0.1 ohms. So 0 0.1 ohms is open. So this is, I mean, 0 0.1 ohms is shorted see that there you go so 0 0.1 ohms is shorted so this is what you don't want to have in a contactor you want it to be overload which means open so the negative contactor is just like this where it has nothing else connected so you would have to read open or overload in your resistive reading from your negative input to your negative output but as for the positive contactor, that's where we have a pre-charge resistor. So if you were to put this resistive um, ohmmeter on the positive of the battery to the positive of the output, you would read 25 ohms in a V2 controller. Now in the Model 3 controller, you would read about 1,000 ohms because we have a higher voltage there for that pre-charging. But for the V2 controller, you should read about 25 ohms. And also, uh, when the contactor is closed, you would read zero ohms because it's a straight connection through the bat, uh, from the uh, positive to the positive output. Now, if your contactor is welded, even if there's a 25 ohm resistor, since this is the shortest and easiest path of connectivity, you would read zero, oh, 0 0.1 ohms going from the positive to the positive. Now, do note that I'm not taking any measurements right now because there's a voltage across this, and if you put a ohm meter while there's a voltage you won't get an accurate reading so if I wanted to measure the cables right now I would power this down entirely 
then put the positive and negative leads of the ohm meter and check the resistance. And now moving on, so that explains that pre-charging. I'm going to come back here again. Uh, this component alone is very expensive, and this is kind of the most important part of this controller. It basically isolates the batteries from anything else that you connect on the output side. So without that pre-charging, like if you have a DC switch, that has to be on so that we can do pre-charging. And without that pre-charging, you would weld these contactors and that would render this useless until you replace these contactors. So we've done lots of repairs of these, so that's why I'm trying to pass that message out again so that more customers will know to how to maintain this device and how to do the pre-charging so that you don't have to worry about this. Now with our Signia inverters, our 24 volt and 48 volt, uh, 6 kilowatt and 12, uh, 15 kilowatt respectively, um, they do not have a DC switch on the input side. So that means when you turn on this controller, you don't have to worry about another DC switch, you don't have to worry about pre-charging because the controller does it by itself. But with other examples such as Victron or other different kind of inverters that I can't think of names right now, they have a DC switch on the input side of the inverter where if you do this pre-charging and then you turn it on, you will weld those contactors. So that is what you want to avoid with our ESP32 controller if you have a different kind of inverter. Now I'm going to move on from pre-charging and kind of explain to you something that we noticed with uh, Windows laptops or Windows devices. So I'm going to plug in a USB cable from the ESP32 controller while it's running to a Windows laptop. Ziki, if you can turn a little bit, show my laptop over here. There you go. So if you notice, you can see the light still on and I'm plugging in the USB to the USB port. And soon as I do, the controller shut down and is rebooting. You see the 12 volts is still on, but the contact is open and now the controller is rebooting. What happens there is a bug with Windows devices itself, where whenever a USB device is connected to the port, it reboots that serial port and reboots whatever is connected to that USB connection. So if you want to uh, plug in with a Windows laptop, what you need to do is turn this off and then plug this in and then turn it on. So this right now is not a problem because the contactors are rebooting again and no, no, pro, no loads on, on this except for the couple lights on the ground. So this is not a big problem. But if you have solar connected to an inverter where this is powering and you plug in this, you would s suddenly turn off this controller which basically removes the batteries from the inverter. And if you have solar connected to that inverter, you could damage that inverter. So if you have a Windows laptop, this is something you want to watch out for. So if you're plugging in a Windows laptop to troubleshoot this, always make sure to turn off the solar, turn off the inverter, turn off this, and then you can plug in the USB to see what the error is. And um, now I'm going to explain also here, when I try to uh, connect on cool term, I'm just going to hit the connect button. Oh, I don't have the port. Yeah. Give me a second. I'm going to rescan, find the port. There you go. And you see, it's shut down again. And that was, I didn't force it to shut down. I was just trying to connect to the port. Now, it's still rebooting, as you can see. And it's um, doing its thing. But again, since there's no load on this, not a problem. But if you have solar and an inverter, this is something you want to watch out for. So I'm going to take my laptop out of here and I'm going to get Jack's laptop which is an Apple MacBook which is what we work with mostly around here and if you notice um, controllers boot up again I'm going to plug in the USB and nothing so like I said it's mostly a Windows issue that causes that rebooting and I have not seen it reboot with a Mac OS or even the Linux uh, Raspberry Pi. Um, if you plug it into a Raspberry Pi, nothing happens. 
control is still running, we can access it, we can get data, no issues whatsoever. And um, yeah, so if you have a Windows device, that is something you want to watch out for, especially if you have Solar 2, you don't want to be plugging it into a Windows device while it's uh, charging or discharging on uh, an inverter. Um, because that can, well, if you're discharging, it's perfectly fine because the batteries would simply disconnect. But if you're charging on solar, as soon as the batteries are disconnected, there's too much solar and nowhere to go, that can damage your inverter. So that's why we recommend using Mac OS or Linux uh, devices with our ESP32. But if you do have a uh, Windows laptop, you would need to reboot this and then connect. So now I'm going to talk about how to connect to the ESP32 with a Mac OS device or even a Windows. I'm just going to explain how the cool term settings are going to work. So I'm taking a screen recording of uh, Jack's laptop right now too, so I can kind of run through the instructions again. And um, so if you look over here, uh, I'm going to open cool term and then go to options. Um, and have the USB already plugged in, and when I hit rescan serial ports, it shows me a USB serial 14100. Now, if I unplug this USB and hit rescan serial ports again, you see I don't have that port anymore. So I'm gonna plug this back in, and I kind of explained this in the previous video with the Raspberry Pi, but I thought this um, full screen recording will explain it. Oh, explain it much clearer that you can see what I'm doing. So I'm going to do rescan serial ports again. Go to this port and hit OK. Oh, let me show you one more thing. I also have terminal in line mode and handle form feed character turned on. So these two and baud rate and port is only about everything you will be changing as everything else is already by default. Hit OK hit connect and now I'm getting data from the ESP32 controller. So you can see right now I have charge enable on and heat enable off and that is because um, right now our voltage is at 45 volts which is um, 3.8, uh, 3.7 uh, average of 3.8 volts per cell and if I go to configuration screen by hitting this arrow or you can hit a question mark um, this is the configuration screen and you can see the charge resume is set to 3.9 and as we are below 3.9 we are going to be charge, uh, charge enable is going to be on. So what I'm going to try to do here is explain what our different uh, charge enable and heat enable functions can do. So first off with the basic um, setup right now when charge enable is on I have this two pin connector that comes with our ESP32s, you get three of these for the three uh, female ends of these two pin connectors. So the male ends are gonna plug in. Uh, when I plug it into the 12 volts, you'll see that this 12 volt LED lights up immediately because that's just a 12 volt output. And now, if I plug into the charge enable, you can see charge enable is on. And I'm going back over here on the computer and you can see charge enable is on right now and if I enter this command 4 and hit enter you can see charge enable was turned off but now turned on again because still our charge resume is set to something over our average cell. So to change that I'm gonna hit resume equals 3.7 enter change and then enter 4 again and you now you can see charge enable is forced off and it stays off. And if I enter 4 again and enter, charge enable comes on and stays on. So 4 is to control charge enable on and off. And again, like I said, uh, this can control chargers and other devices that can be used as charging uh, functions for the battery. And that can be an MPPT charge controlled uh, solar setup uh, where you can wire this to a relay and it would comp just disconnect the relay from the system or plug, uh, connect it to where it can start charging batteries. And so charge resume is the voltage where the controller will allow charging again, as it says charge resume, and charge cutoff is where the controller will stop it from charging when it gets to that voltage. So right now I've set uh, charge resume 
to 3.7, so as we are above 3.7, it doesn't have to resume. That's why when I hit enter 4, charge enable goes off and stays off. But now if the voltage was to get down to 3.7, this would automatically come on and allow for charging if a charger is plugged in. So this ESP32 controller also has a CAN port, which is how most of our chargers are communicating with this. This already has the TCCH CAN uh, software, uh, communication software. So when you plug in uh, RJ45 or uh, Ethernet port into this, this is PoE, so it has 12 volts with it too. It'll communicate with the charger and allow charging. Right now, our charger is disconnected, so I'm not actually charging. I'm just showing how you would plug this in. It just has uh, two wires for communication, CAN, zero, CAN 1 low and CAN 1 high, and then it has two wires for 12 volts it, that can be used for other devices. Um, so while charge enable is off, it won't enable the charging for coming on, but when you have this plugged in and charge enable is on, then you would start charging. And like I said, this can be used for relays to control different items. Uh, going on to heat enable, I'm gonna unplug this and plug it to heat enable. So in the default setting, where when we ship it out from this building, um, heat enable and charge enable are designed to work just as what they're adv advertised as a, to control a charger and to control heaters or heating pads. So when I turn on heat enable, which is a uh, enter a 5 command, you can see uh, heat enable is turned on. So I'm going back to the main screen by entering a back arrow and you can see here heat enable is on and it stays on. And that is also because right now we are reading a temperature of 11.9 degrees Celsius which is pretty cold and our uh, heat, heat low temp is set to 5 and since this is within uh, 10 degrees Celsius of the low, it'll come on and stay on. So that way it would uh, start a heating pad and it would keep it warm until it gets 10 degrees above the low temp. Now, for it to work by itself, so if the temperature was to get down below five degrees Celsius, this would turn on and uh, start a heating pad or whatever that would need to keep it warm. And in the summer, you can also use this as to cool. So if the batteries get up to 48 degrees Celsius, or in this configuration, 55 degrees Celsius, it would turn on this again, and you would wire a, a cooling system, a fan, whatever you would need to cool it. And as soon as it gets to that temperature, it will turn on that cooling system and let the batteries cool down. And when it gets 10 degrees below its uh, high temp, it will turn off that cooling system. Now, one thing I want to explain here again is, you can see I'm just wired, I only wired a simple LED. This does not take much current. It's a, a simple 12 volt LED. So what you would need if you're using a, a high power unit like a heating pad, which are, that has high inductance, so that would take a lot of 12 volts. Or if you were to use a, a big relay that has a high current draw, you don't want to be connecting it directly to this. Uh, I had a board, oh, it's right here. <clears throat> so this is the shield that we use to control the heat enable and charge enable and also the two control contactors. And you can see these are the MOSFETs that we turn on and off to turn the switches on and off. So if you were to put a high load uh, resistor or a, a heating pad or a relay that's a big current draw, you would simply melt these out and render this useless. So you would need to replace this if that is to happen. So what we recommend is using a simple automotive relay. Uh, let me pull this out, there you go. And that's, it has uh, five terminals on the end for the co two for the coil and one for the common, one for normally open and one for normally closed. And this can allow up to 30 amps um, going through here with the external power supply uh, to turn on and off whatever you would need to. So I'm gonna plug this into heat enable and you heard that click. Uh, that is because it's on right now. Um, and if I enter a five, I'm gonna pull my mic. Sorry if it's too loud. So you can hear this click. 
Now I'm going to enter a 5 here. Heat enable is off. And enter a 5 here again. Heat enable is on. And so that basically, what that does is you can control heavy load items using uh, automotive relay so that you don't damage the shield. And if you do damage the shield, you would simply need to buy a replacement and it would still work with a new shield as you won't be damaging anything else. Um, moving on, I want to explain our other functions, or the secret functions, like I said, um, but it's actually explained pretty well in our manual. But since I've been getting technical questions with emails about these, that's why I want to dive in and kind of explain this as well. So if you were to be using our Signia inverter or any other inverter that has a frequency shift setting, like the Sandy that's behind me, you would use the charge enable output to toggle the frequency shift. So right now you can see charge enable is off. And as it's so, I'm going to go into the configurations here and show you cutoff is set to 4.05, resume is set to 3.7. So this configuration is still set for a regular heating pad and a regular charger. Now, if I were to use this for a frequency shift setting, I'm going to set resume and cut off to the same value, which is right now 4.05. So as soon as I enter that, you can see they're both the same value. And you see this extra line that shows up here, which is frequency shift events, bump count, and grid. So this hidden part of code comes on only if the charge cutoff resume is the same value or the heat uh, high temp and low temp is the same value, which I will explain that part in a little bit here. So with the charge cut off and resume at the same value, we are now using that charge enable output as a frequency shift. And now a secret command here is if you enter a F, it does a frequency shift. You can see the frequency shift events going up, and you can see the LED flashing for half a second, which would be closing that dry contact on the inverter uh, frequency shift relay and closing that together turns on the sh shift in frequency from 60 hertz to 62.5 hertz just for that half, half a second, which would turn off all your grid tied inverters. I'm going to put up a wiring diagram for the frequency shift relay on here. And you can see the two wires going simply from the charge enable output to the relay and two wires from the relay to the frequency shift. And again, you don't want to directly wire the charge enable to the inverter because you would damage the inverter because it's not so designed to handle 12 volts. Instead, it's just designed to be open and close. So going back here, now you can see bump count isn't doing anything because our current average cell is only 3.799. So I can show you uh, what happens if I set cutoff equals um, 3. Uh, 7 and resume equals 3.7 and what happens now is we set our frequency shift to happen at 3.7 now since we are above 3.7 you can see the bump count increasing and what that bump count is basically it's counting up um, up to 60 seconds and if this after 60 seconds if uh, the let me clear that. Yeah, for 60 seconds, if the voltage is still above our cutoff and resume value, we will do a frequency shift. So you can see we're still at three frequency shift events going up on 40 seconds. And as soon as we get to 60, you will see this flash for half a second. And then we're almost there. Five seconds, two, one and flash. And our bump count went up. It's going to keep going up since we're still above the cutoff and resume. And our frequency shift events just went up one more. So this is what you would use if you have a Signia inverter or a Sandy inverter, and you want to do a frequency shift to turn off your grid tied solar. And so you would set your cutoff and resume, obviously, to a higher value, somewhere like 4 volts per cell. That way, you can get more capacity before you have to turn off your solar just for your solar tied grid tied inverters. Um, and also with this, um, this 
cut off and resume is kind of a way to shut down your solar without shutting down your entire system. And to shut down your entire system is what we have the high volt uh, cut off for. So when you get to the high volt, we open the contactor, sh shut down the whole system to protect the batteries because for some reason we went too high of a voltage. But using the cut off and resume, we can just turn off only the solar grid tied application uh, devices. That way we can still power the system with the controller and only turn off devices that would turn off when you get to 62 hertz. So that shows uh, controlling the frequency shift from uh, cutoff and resume. Now with this, if you were to plug in a charger with the ethernet port, now since your cutoff and resume is set to the same value, a charger won't do anything because it would see that you want to cut off at a voltage that's um, the same as the resume voltage so the charger won't be doing anything as it can't decide you should to turn, turn on or turn off. So what you would want to do if you have a system where you want to do a frequency shift and charging, which is about 10 to 20 percent of our customers. Um, again, I should say most of the customers that, we, that I know of only have the system where they use a charger and they have a heating pad and most of the customers actually don't even need heating pads because it doesn't get that cold in whatever garage or building they're living it in. But for customers that have Signia inverters that want to do frequency shift and want a charger, that would be what they would need to do. They would set their cutoff uh, to a value uh, that would usually turn a charger off, say 3.05, and set resume to a value that you would usually want the charger to turn on. Somewhere like 3.4 is kind of a good value. Now, when you want to do a frequency shift still, you would set your high temp and low temp to the same value so that you can still use a charger and control frequency shift using the heat enable output. So what I'm gonna do is set high temp equal to 48 and low temp equal to 48. Now, they don't have to be 48. I'm, I just set it to 48 just because that's the number that came up to my head first. And now they're both the same value. And you can see I still have frequency shift events and bump count and grid off. Now, the bump count isn't going up because we are under the charge cutoff voltage. Now, if I want to bring the cutoff down to four, uh, sorry, 3.7 volts again. Whoa, no, 3.7. Now we are below, I mean, our average cell is above cutoff, and now you can see bump count going up again. Now, right now, I'm still plugged into charge enable, so we're not going to do much here. As you can see, it didn't check, toggle anything on or off, but going into the heat enable, now we can use the heat enable as a frequency shift. Right now we are still counting up from 15 seconds, so we'll give it about 45 more seconds and we'll uh, see it. What do you do for 40 seconds when you have to wait for something? I don't know, but well. Um, so one thing you do need to know is now since high temp and low temp is set to the same value, if the batteries were to get too cold or if the batteries were to get too hot, you, the controller can't do anything about it because since you're using the high temp to control other uh, frequency shift devices, this uh, heat, heat enable will be rendered um, only for the frequency shift setting and not to protect the batteries if it gets too hot or too cold, which most of the customers, if they have it in a room where it's uh, climate controlled, they don't ever need to use high temp uh, or heat enable to use for anything else. So that's that's the reason they would, that's why they can use this as a frequency shift, use a charger as long as it's in a climate controlled environment. Now if you do have it in a garage where it's not climate controlled, then you can always use a different Arduino or some uh, thermostat to control uh, some sort of heating or cooling system where you would monitor the temperatures around the batteries and if it gets too cold or too hot, you can enable that externally. But if you're using a frequency shift from our controller, then you won't be able to use the heating and cooling in this configuration. And that wraps up the heat enable used as frequency shift. Now I want to do one more, 
which is our heat enable being used to control the grid, which is the last function over here on the display, which that shows grid off. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to set heat enable uh, high temp and low temp back to what it used to be equals uh, well, let me set low temp first because if not, it would shut down. Low temp equals 5, temp equals 55, and you can see that last line where it shows grid off has gone away. So, to bring that to control the grid using the heat enable output, you would enter a question mark again or the left right arrow one more time and you come to this page which is the AC grid scheduler and it is as it is advised it can control two contactors or however many contactors you would want to turn on and off a grid that would power a charger that would charge these batteries. Um, I guess you could also control a charger if you had to wire the charger controlled with a 12 volt relay. So. In our configuration, I'm going to put up a photo here. This is what you would see uh, in the input side of our PowerSafe 100. You can see the two wires going uh, from the side here, going into the relay, and you have the AC wires coming up and going in to the uh, main switch first, and from the main switch to the relay, and from the relay going in to our Signia 15 kilowatt inverter. And this way, we can even if the switch is uh, I mean, we can manually turn off, <clears throat> turn on and off the AC input without having to only rely on the relay. And if the relays or the contactors got welded, this way we can turn off and replace or work on it without having it to be uh, live voltage. Now, those relays, uh, contactors, are what I have over here. These are GV200MA-1 contactors, Gigavax. And you can see there are two wires, uh, positive and negative, and two terminals where you would tie in your AC. Now these are <coughs> DC contactors, and DC contractors are more than plenty enough, uh, strong enough to handle uh, AC voltage. But it's not the other way around. AC voltage always goes through zero 60 times a second, 60 hertz frequencies. <coughs> it goes from zero to 240 and zero to switches back and forth so many times so these contactors are more than strong enough to handle it but an AC relay cannot handle the DC current because uh, it does not go through 0 60 times a second so we have these in stock so if you're thinking of using a grid control with our uh, controller you would need uh, two of these uh, you can't turn off just one leg because it makes 240 volts and we've tried that and blown up an inverter so you would need two contactors and you would turn off both contactors so you can isolate both legs from the inverter. So what you would do, you would take the positive and negative from this, positive and negative from this, wire those two together and simply wire it to the heat enable output. And what happens from that is you would wire the input from your grid, or you would wire the wires from your grid to one side of the contactor and wire the other side of this to either a charger or our Signia 15 kilowatt has a built-in charger, so you would wire this to the input side of the Signia 15 kilowatt. And what that does is, when you want the grid to come on, this 12 volts gets activated, which activates this contactors, and that allows the 240 volts to pass into the inverter or charger that would either bypass or start charging your batteries and bypass. So you can set up your configurations however you want, but this is one example of how to do that. So, so if you're connected to the Wi-Fi, uh, what we do is we, uh, if you're connected to the internet access Wi-Fi, what we can do is we can get the data uh, to the current time, and using our current time, you can control the grid to come on and off. So what you see from 00 to 23 are the 23 hours in a day, and you can simply use these configuration, uh, these settings to turn on and off the grid to come on at different times of the day. So especially if you're in California where they monitor, um, you have different prices for electricity at different times of the day, this would be something very useful where you would charge your batteries at a cheaper time of the day and then go off grid when the price of electricity goes up. 
And so you can use different times of the day to turn on the grid on and different times of the day to turn the grid off. And you would use the heat enable output to control relays that would supply or uh, turn off and on the 240 volts that can turn on the charger or um, turn on um, the grid so that you can use it to bypass or charge based on the voltage from the grid. And so with that, I think we are done with mostly what uh, this ESP32 can do and our functions with our heat enable and charge enable. And now I want to move on from this into the display, right there. And we recently found out with our VNC server uh, function where you can control and watch the display as long as you have a Wi-Fi connection on a mobile device. And so that means everyone who already has a V2 with our new oh, Raspberry Pi displays, you can now get your data on your mobile device as long as you have an internet connection to the display um, that is already set up. And I'm gonna explain that with the VNC server uh, that is already in this and the VNC viewer on this laptop. And lastly, I'm gonna get the VNC server on my mobile, VNC viewer on my mobile phone and show you how to log in to an account so you can see the data. And um, let's go on and check, out, check that out. Well, here at EVTV, we are constantly uh, innovating and improving our products. And we have several new products I'd like to talk to you about today. And these are uh, based on the Tesla module and a harnessing system that goes along with our uh, BMS controllers. Uh, we have extended uh, the wire harnessing uh, to increase the length between the connectors. Okay. So this is a um, stock harness which each one of these goes to your Tesla module and then uh, this end goes to your controller and what we have done is we have made this entire cable twice as long and this allows for uh, several advantages uh, it, it kind of grew out of actually yachts I had several yacht builds that couldn't always put their batteries all together and stack them as neatly as the uh, some of our builds have shown. So we have an extended version of the wiring harness and that will allow you to keep your modules a little farther apart. Uh, I possibly have a little different stacking configuration uh, and give you much more flexibility. You won't be as tight. And we have them in the four module with the extension, if you're going up to say 12, 15, or 20, or 30 modules, we have uh, the extension harness, we have it in the four module harness, and we have it in the two module harness, and we also still have our extender where you can move the controller away from the battery pack as well. So we are doing a lot to enhance uh, how you work with our controller and how you configure your battery pack. So that's something new at EVT. That is the extended uh, uh, long length uh, wiring harness. And that will allow you to have some flexibility when you arrange your Tesla modules. Now, since we're um, increasing the distance between the modules, we also have uh, some new connecting cables. These will come with the lug set to the Tesla module bolting, as well as heat shrink mechanically clamped and in a flexible wire. This is all pre-made, and I know that a lot of people that are uh, out there in the world, it is uh, one step closer really to plug and play. You have a little bit less to assemble. You don't have to get your tools out. You don't have to uh, or order cabling. This is special silicone. Uh, wiring and uh, it comes it's basically a four odd so it's uh, some pretty stout stuff we're gonna have it in three lengths a 24 inch an 18 inch and a 12 inch and that will allow you to um, uh, again if you move your batteries apart if you have something else you want to connect to 
Uh, it will give you a, another option in your Tesla module uh, uh, configuration. So these will be in the store. We'll have photos on those. Uh, they're not really, um, uh, they're, they're priced moderately, but uh, four out cable is expensive. And it is all pre-made and it saves you, the uh, end user, some hassles. This is also our new um, water-cooled um, charger. This is a high voltage charger. It is going to be in the store. You can see all the cabling is pre-made. A little bit easier than some of our other models. It's got the jets in the back for a, a circulating wa uh, uh, cooling system, uh, as well as your standard connectors uh, on almost all the chargers on this side. And it's pretty substantial, but it's not that big. Pretty easy mounting, mounting plates. The technical details will also be on the store. This is going to be right around $2,700 uh, in the store. Uh, one thing about it is uh, we do have EV customers and we, we have uh, large battery pack customers that use the higher voltage chargers. Uh, uh, with the EV customers, they uh, always, you know, we had several that would buy the uh, a Lear charger and then another uh, DC to DC converter from us, and that ended up really being over $3,000. This is actually a less cost, and it's all together. It's not two devices that you have to mount. Uh, so it has you know, a lot of advantages, and it's several hundred dollars less. And that, um, all that Lear and all that stuff has is, is kind of run its course. It's, it's hard to replace uh, Jack, had to test them and you know, it was just not a perfect scenario. So we now have a new alternative for our customers who are used to getting some of the EV parts from us. So spread the word or if you got a really big battery pack and you want uh, a, a, a water cooled charger, this is a, a good option. Now it is only in high voltage. Uh, it comes, it can charge from uh, 85 to 265 volt AC, so it would work fine with a standard 240 volt US. Uh, it has an output of somewhere between 200 and 420 uh, DC. It's 6.6 .6 kilowatts, and it's CAN controlled. And then the real quicker kicker is it has a secondary DC to DC converter that is already built in, so you will have uh, a secondary source, especially if you have 12 volt systems uh, you want to support, uh, it will uh, allow you to do that in your, um, especially in your vehicle. So we have a lot of calls for uh, DC to DC conversion. We have a lot of cars, calls for chargers. This item puts it all together. I will also put uh, the tech sheet along with it. And these are our new products here at EVTV. Keep checking that store. You might see a bargain in there every once in a while, and we're going to continue to innovate and offer new things to our customers, and uh, we certainly appreciate you supporting the mission here at EVTV. Stay tuned. So now I'm going to show you how to go ahead and connect with the VNC uh, device that you can see this display anywhere else in the world. So if you're in the same building as the server, then it's pretty simple. You would just download VNC Viewer and enter the IP address that is displayed on our display. And when you have that IP address, you can see the display on whatever device that you have the VNC Viewer on. And as long as it's in the same building, it's pretty simple, it's pretty straightforward. Now, if you're going outside of the building um, where you don't have the same IP, um, same network connection as the server, these instructions are gonna be useful. So first step would be, uh, we would need to make an account with RealVNC. So to do that, I'm gonna go here to realvnc.com and then go to sign in. And I'm gonna enter our sales at EVTV email address.me. I am not a robot. Oh boy, tractors. Do I know what tractors are? and go next so this is going to send me uh, 
Oh, it's going to help me set up a password. So for this um, setup, I'm going to do password as a password. Oh, no, I don't want a recommended password. Password one, two, three. And I'm going to use this as a personal use. And I am over the age of 16, believe it or not. And uh, red, and I don't need that. And just like that, I made an account. Oh, I need my name, sorry. Um, Oh, wait, I'm going to do EVTV. There you go. I don't need that either. Sign up. Oh, I do need that. Psych. And sign up. I can save it. That's fine. And now I have a real VNC account. But now I need to go ahead and verify this with our EVTV.me. So I'm going to pause this right here while I go verify it with uh, Richard, who has access to this account. So I got the email verified with uh, Richard's account. And now uh, I just need the password and username to do the rest of the steps. So you have the, we have the display back here, which I'm going to, uh, I already set up VNC. So you can see the display on the computer. And it's much more zoomed in and more detailed than what you would see on this camera. So what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to go to the main page first. As you can see, I'm controlling the display here, but the display back here is also changing with it. I'm going to hit exit. And then I'm going to go to the VNC server that's up here. And you can see right now I'm connected to the EVTV Wi-Fi. So I'm going to go to the VNC server here. And I'm going to go up here, go to licensing which is how you would log into a new account. And I'm going to go sales at evtv.me. And password is password123. I'm going to change that once we're done with the video. Actually, I don't need that. Sign in. And I'm just going to go home subscription because as, if you have less than five devices, you can use a home subscription and you'll be able to watch this uh, data from any display as long as it's under five servers and five viewers. But if you're going into where you have a lot of devices, which some of our customers do, uh, you would need to purchase an enterprise subscription or a professional subscription. But for this scenario, I'm just going to go with a home subscription. Hit next and Raspberry Pi is the name. Or you can change it to whatever name you want in the team, which your team would be your account name. And while this is happening here, I have C1 out of five companies in team. And I'm logged into the team. So basically what's happening is this VNC data is now being uploaded to the team that's on with this account. So I'm going to use my phone over here and go to the VNC app but I'm going to start recording so you guys can see what I'm doing. So I'm going to record on my, com my phone here and I'm going to go to sign in and I'm going to enter sales at evtv.me and password is password123 and hit continue and now we're going to have to do uh, verification again because since it's a new device you want that main email address to verify this so I'm gonna go back to Richard again to get this verified so I have access to that email account with my mobile device so I went ahead and got Richard to authorize my sign in on my mobile device and now you can see it says Danu EV TV on this account and over here I have Raspberry Pi and when I connect I can see the same display oh sorry I need to login first. So the password and username here is the same thing that we have with our uh, displays. It's pi and use password EVTV. Now this is not going to be changed because this is by default on all our displays. So hit continue and there you go. Now my phone recording is the same as the recording on the Raspberry Pi. So I can control the Raspberry Pi from here and I can see all the data. But right now, I'm still on Wi-Fi. So this, is, this looks like what it is as usual. 
but this is where it gets interesting. I'm going to turn off my Wi-Fi, go on an LTE data, data connection. So this means I'm, I can connect from anywhere. And now I click Raspberry Pi. Now you can see it contacts with the real VNC services and connects over the Wi-Fi, EVTV, and remember password, continue. And just like that, over a LTE connection, I can see the data from the Raspberry Pi display. And all our customers can do this now. And so you can see this data from any mobile device anywhere in the world as long as your Raspberry Pi server has access to the internet. So this is going to be beneficial to a lot of the customers that wanted the data on their mobile device and didn't have uh, access to it before. So, but I really have to thank um, Troy Rutherford and Mike Beebe. I think I'm pronouncing that last name properly, but I'm sorry if I'm not. Mike Beebe and Troy Rutherford. Um, they actually guided us in this direction where they showed us uh, using uh, the VNC server or VNC Viva on their mobile device, but they used a Raspberry Pi server uh, that was separate from ours to transmit that data over the network into a mobile device. But what we found out was we could directly use the VNC that's already in our uh, Raspberry Pi and just simply make an account for free too and just log into it on another mobile device and you would have this data. But as long as it's under five devices and this will work with no with, with no necessary need for a port forwarding or any other background setting uh, configurations you need to do. This is, I just did all this on my mobile device right now, right in front of you, so that you can follow these instructions and do this yourself. And with that, um, that concludes this video, and thank you for watching. This is with EVTV. I'm Dano De Silva. Stay with us for more. Gentlemen. We've come to the end of 2020. We're getting ready for Christmas season, and we just want to say thank you to all the viewers and uh, pay a remembrance to Jack. He was a wonderful friend to all of us here at EVTV and uh, uh, certainly learned a lot from him. And I will say that he was laid to rest with honor, and uh, we're continuing his legacy here. So, Danny, what would you like to say? Yes, I am definitely thankful for Jack for giving me this opportunity to work here. I've been able to put my hands in a lot of expensive equipment, thanks to Jack, so definitely remembering him. And, um, but yeah, Ziggy, what do you have to say? Um, I want to say uh, I, I appreciate to uh, meet Jack and like Danu and uh, Richard right here at EBTV. I think I learned a lot of things I never I never got before, so I really appreciate about it. Yep. Well, uh, Happy New Year, Merry Christmas, and all the holiday wishes to all of our viewers. And we're going to hear from Colin, another team member, and we'll be back next year in 2021 with lots of videos, new products, new builds. We love hearing from, from our viewers, so uh, let's let Colin take it away. We'll see you all next year. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. <laughs> Hello EVTV viewers, uh, this is Colin Kidder with EVTV and I'd like to wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Uh, me and Remington here. Uh, remembering Jack, uh, the life that he lived and the uh, many years that I've known him. It's been a pleasure to have worked with him for so long and I hope that uh, during this holiday season Everybody remembers his vast contributions to the electric vehicle scene. Uh, so wishing you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And hope for many great things in 2021.